Your generosity fuels all of Westside's efforts to make disciples, equip families, and share Christ's love here and around the world. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you, or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And then the king will answer them, Truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. Your generous giving enables Westside to maximize our impact for the kingdom of God throughout Kansas City. When we serve the hungry, the stranger, the sick, the prisoner, the most vulnerable among us, we serve Jesus. I got involved in the human trafficking ministry at Westside when God gave me the burden to reach the women and the children in the Kansas City area. I see Jesus in the transformed lives of the believers here at Lansing. The joy that they exhibit despite their circumstances is, is remarkable. It can't be anything other than the work of the Holy Spirit in their lives. I love how Westside partners with schools. We're able to serve so many families in our own backyard, and we give support to teachers and resources that they desperately need. When schools and churches partner together, that's what excites me the most, seeing Jesus work in that way in this community. I see Jesus at Avenue of Life and how they work with the homeless population to break the cycle of poverty. The model Avenue of Life uses in their programs has reduced homelessness in the Kansas City, Kansas School District 500 by 60% or more. That model is being duplicated in other cities and other programs because of what they do here. And that makes me so proud to be a part. We wanted to adopt when we realized that we were adopted into God's family, chosen and loved by Him, and we wanted to provide that for kids in a practical way. I love how easy Westside makes it to see and then get involved in the foster and adoption care ministry. Where do you see Jesus? Where do you see Jesus? Where do you see Jesus? You helped make these blessings possible through your faithful giving. Thank you. Hello, Westside Family Church. It's great to see you here in the North Sanctuary. Those of you who gathered right next door in the South Sanctuary, our awesome Speedway campus. Those of you watching online, a particular shout out today to Megan, who is watching from Memphis, Tennessee. Let's give it up to Megan and all those who have joined us online around the world. We love having you with us. Uh, first of all, uh, I want you to know that there is a motto in this church that really describes the heart of this church if you're visiting. It goes like this. If they won't come to the church, we'll take the church to them, right? If they won't come to the church, we'll take the church to them. And what we have seen in the Westside Family Church is in the pattern and in the, and in the, in the uh, spirit of God, we go to the hungry, the thirsty, the stranger, the homeless, the sick, the prisoner, the voiceless, the victim, the fatherless, and we seek to bring them hope in the name of Jesus. And every time that we take the church out of the building to these people who are hurting and meet them in their time of need, we find Jesus right in the middle of it. And you know what? Jesus is what it's all about. And so I wanna thank you for your generosity. Every single dollar you give, a portion of that money goes out to, su to support the things that you've just seen and so many more. I've been involved in some amazing churches in my 30 years of ministry. This year is my 30th year of pastoral ministry. I've been involved in some amazing churches, but I've never been involved in a church where a higher percentage uh, goes out of all the money that comes in. This is the church that does the highest percentage of any church I've been a part of, and that should make you encouraged about that, right? That is so 
Awesome. So not only am I thankful you for your generosity, but I also want to thank you who get your hands dirty with those who are hurting. And I would love to see that tribe increase at Westside Family Church. Instead of just mobilizing individuals to those who are hurting or far from God, imagine with me squads and platoons of people leaving the building to help those who are struggling. And uh, that is a vision that we are working on right now as a church and and, and, our, and our leadership. And we're going to be talking to you that in the days to come for the church to be the church in our city and beyond. Does that make you excited? Man, that gets me super excited. And uh, that's what I want to talk to you a little bit about today uh, as we open up God's word, if you're okay with that. Is that okay? Well, let's uh, pray. And then we got a lot of work to do. Father, we thank you so much for um, allowing us to be in your presence today. And right now, I invite everybody hearing my words to just take a deep breath. And Father, come into your presence with an open heart and an open mind and open hands to receive what you have for them today. Father, may you allow me to stay out of the way of everything you wanna do in the lives of these people today. Those who are here in this room, in the South Sanctuary, and Speedway, and those who are watching online, have your will with all of us. We pray this in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said. Amen. I want to begin with a true story that was reported a few years ago in the Boston Globe. Uh, let me read it to you. It can never be said that Adelie Gabor's neighbors were less than responsible. When her front lawn grew hip high, they had the local boy mow it down. When her pipes froze and burst, they had the water turned off. When the mail spilled out the front door, they called the police. The only thing they didn't do was to check to see if she was alive. She wasn't. On Monday, police climbed her crumbling brick stoop, broke in the side door of her little blue house, and found what they believed to be the 73-year-old woman's skeleton remains sunk in a five-foot-high pile of trash where they had apparently laid perhaps for as long as four years. It's not really a friendly neighborhood, says Eileen Dugan, 70, once a close friend of Gabor's and whose house sits less than 20 feet away from the dead woman's home. I'm as much to blame as anyone. She was alone and needed someone to talk to, but I was working two jobs and I was sick of her coming over at all hours. Eventually, I stopped answering the door. God said it right on the first pages of the Bible. Genesis chapter two, verse 18. It is not good for the man. It's not good for the woman either to be alone. And God wasn't kidding. Matter of fact, Solomon later is going to tell another sad story like Adeline Gabor's, and then he follows it up with these facts. On page 260 of your Believe book, also Ecclesiastes chapter four, he writes, two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. Also, if two lie down together and are married, it doesn't say that, but it should. <laughs> they will keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. Which leads to our key question today, found on page 257 of your Believe book. Take a look at this question. How do I develop healthy relationships with each other? And so today, as we continue in our series called Believe, in this particular session, we are uncovering the 10 key spiritual disciplines of living the Christian life. If you want to be more successful in the power of God, in living out what it means to be a Christ follower, these are the practices we see modeled in the life of Jesus and covered over in the Word of God. And today, we want to introduce you to this one. It's the spiritual practice of biblical community, biblical community. From the Bible's point of view, there are two foundational things that are required in order for you to develop 
healthy, sustainable relationships. If you're taking notes, write this one down. Number one, put God at the center of your life and community. Put God at the center of your life and community. Healthy community cannot be sustained without God's presence. Mark my word, there is a difference between community and biblical community. There's a difference between community and biblical community. You can have a group of people that are bowling, and that is a community, but it's not necessarily biblical community. A bowling community bowls, a biblical community centers their relationships around the word and the will of God. Now, if a biblical community goes bowling, well, Eureka, that's the best of both worlds. As a matter of fact, we have a gal named Michelle in Leavenworth right now who is at her son's bowling league watching us online. So Eureka, you got both. There you go. Now, it's interesting. God forms two communities in the Bible, one in the Old Testament called Israel and the other in the New Testament we call the church. So God gives us some insights in the formation and the constitution of these two communities. On page 261, or Exodus chapter 25, we get a peek into the community of Israel. And God is going to, in this passage, give Moses instruction about Israel's a living, a living arrangements and the construction of a new a building, a tent, if you will, called the tabernacle. Take a look at this passage. It says, God says to Israel through Moses, have them make a sanctuary for me, and I will dwell among them. God says, I'm going to come down, and I'm going to live among you, and therefore, you're going to need to build a place for me to hang out, a divine casita, if you will. So they follow the instructions of God to the T. The tent, it's very important to see this, the tent was erected in the wilderness right in the center of the community of Israel as they were journeying, moving from Egypt to the promised land. Every time they moved and set up their tents, they set this tent, the tabernacle, up in the center of their community. That is important. And God instructed Moses to build in the back of the tent a room for him called the most holy place. Here's a picture of the temple opened up. Here's the front of it. And in the back, there's this room called the most holy place. This would be the dwelling place, the house of God. And it was sectioned off by a huge purple curtain because the people in the Old Testament did not have direct access to God. Even though God's presence was going to be with them 24-7, they did not have direct access to God. He was quarantined in this most holy place in the back of the tabernacle. Why? Because the forgiveness of sins was not actually made possible through the animal sacrifices of the Old Testament. As it turns out, they were mere symbols of what was to come through Jesus Christ. So because their sins had not been adequately atoned for, they could not actually have accessed themselves into the presence of God. Okay? Now, what we realize is that um, uh, God is going to come down, and in Exodus chapter 40, verse 33, we have a record of the first day that God is going to descend from the heavens into his new home. This is the first time that God is coming down to dwell with the people since he left the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve. Look at the page 262 of your Believe book, or Exodus chapter 40. It says, Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Moses could not enter the tent of meeting because the cloud had settled on it and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Can you imagine being there the day that God moved in? His presence comes from the heavens and his presence is so thick filling the temple that Moses could not even get in. The success of Israel from that day forward and everybody knew it was catalyzed by the presence of God. As long as they were following God, everything Israel does 
was gold. Everything was success. As a matter of fact, Moses was so convinced that their secret sauce was the presence of God amongst them that he, that he is the difference maker in their community. Moses goes to God and says this in Exodus chapter 33. He said to God, if your presence does not go with us, do not send us up from here. How will anyone know that you are pleased with me and with your people unless you go with us? What else will distinguish me and your people from all the other people on the face of the earth? And the same thing is true for us. The presence of God in the center of our community is essential if we desire to be successful. And so therefore, we need to be equally as passionate about the presence of God being at the center of our lives and our community as Moses. But for us, as we turn the page from the Old Testament to the New Testament, something dramatically happens in the new community that God is forming called the church. The Bible teaches that simultaneous with Christ's last breath on the cross, this is what happens in Matthew chapter 27. Jesus' last breath, at that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, that large purple curtain that quarantined God off from us at the moment Christ died is torn from top to bottom by God and the Spirit of God is no longer sectioned off in this little back room, but that presence of God is now released. So the question is, where does the presence of God go? Well, the New Testament tells us that the presence of God is no longer contained in this room and that those who, because of Christ's sacrifice, has now received atonement or forgiveness of their sins, the Holy Spirit, the presence of God, now takes up residence within us. The word tabernacle in the Hebrew is literally translated dwelling. God is tabernacling now in his believers. He is dwelling in us. And we have now 24-7 direct access to God himself. Can you even wrap your mind around that? You don't believe me? Take a look at 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 16. Paul writes, for we are the temple of the living God. As God said, I will live with them and walk among them and I will be their God and they will be my people. Now, I did not grow up in a Christian home. And after I became a Christian, I started to hang out around healthy, functional Christian families. Not perfect families, but healthy, functional Christian families. And I could instantly, even as a teenager, detect the difference. And even to this day, I can do this. I can walk into a home and take a whiff. And I can detect whether or not the presence of God is in that home. And I have discovered in my experience of both growing up in a home without the presence of God and hanging out in homes where there is the presence of God that there's a difference. That communities without the presence of God in them, they struggle and there is strife. I watched my parents, although they stayed married the entire time that they were alive. My mom died at age 62. I observed in their marriage relationship that they played defense more than offense. That they survived, but never really thrived. That they were tolerating each other, but not really celebrating each other. And this is not a community but rather a collection of individuals who happen to reside in the same space. I've seen this in many homes, but I'm here, here to tell you that in Christ, it doesn't have to be that way anymore. I want you to look in the middle of page 266 of your Believe book, or Matthew chapter 18, a promise that Jesus gives. I mean, this is huge. He says, for where two or three gather in my name, 
There I am with them. It doesn't say where a cathedral of people are gathering together, masses of people, then I will show up. Just two, just two or three people that would dare together, gather together in his name. He said, I will be in that space. You can't just be Christians. And that's why I can walk into the home of a, a Christian family and I take out with and I do not pick up the presence of Christ. You have to gather in his name. Your agenda has to be centered around his agenda and not yours. And that is why a Christian home can be just as flat or strife-filled or musty as a non-Christian home. And um, one of the first things that I can do to kind of detect why it's not there is I simply ask, Tell me about your dinners. And if the family says, we don't linger around the table for dinner, that's usually clue one for me that there's probably strife in the home and not the presence of Christ. Then I say, tell me if you gather for dinner, tell me how the dinner starts off. And if they say they don't pray, then that's sort of presence of God 101. And if they pray, I ask who prays. And if they if they delegate it to the cute little kid's prayer, which is great like once a year. But we don't have a man or a woman who takes their time and humbles themselves and invites God into that home and thanks him. I know why he's not there. You haven't asked him to be there. To me, it works like a Glade plug-in. I mean, here's a Glade plug-in that I have brought here. Um, uh, here's, the, here's the body. This is, represents your body. And when you trust Christ for the forgiveness of your sin, the Bible says that the Holy Spirit, the presence of God, indwells you. And so this is the oil representing the Holy Spirit. When you trust Christ, the Holy, you, are, you, are, you now have the oil of the Holy Spirit within you, okay? But you, you have the presence of the Holy Spirit within you, but the Holy Spirit is inactive. He's there, but he is inactive. The only way to activate the presence of God in your life and to release the presence of God in your life is you gotta be plugged in to the will and to the word of God. You've gotta be plugged in, and when you do, something very dynamic takes place. It releases the presence of God in your home, a sweet and healing aroma. Let me ask you a, a little trivia question. How many Glade plugins do you believe Randy Frazee has in his home? <laughs> okay, anybody got a guess? I'll give you a little clue. I have two of them in my garage. <laughs> How many? The answer is... 30. I have 30 plugins in my home because Randy Frazee is all about the scent. When you walk into my home and smell, during most of the year, my favorite scent is cinnamon and apples. Roseanne's is Hawaiian breeze. But in the wintertime, we shift gears on you and give you evergreen spruce. But what is more potent than 30 Glade plugins? Is every residence in a home being plugged in to the will and the word of God? When every residence of a home, just two or more, are plugged into the will and to the word of God, it releases the presence of God, the sweet aroma. Now, let me say this to avoid emails. <laughs> I have recently found out that the Glade oils are toxic. <laughs> and so I no longer have this particular brand. We're working on a different solution. So my house physically smells a little so-so, okay? But I can tell you, this illustration breaks down when we talk about the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit's release is never toxic, but it is always healing and it is always sweet. As a matter of fact, one of the primary jobs that I have as the husband and spiritual leader of my home 
is to protect and value the presence of God in my home. The boundaries of my home are sacred. Listen to me, church. This is one of your jobs as well as a man, as a spiritual leader of your home, a woman if you're a single parent. Um, This is one of your jobs is to protect the boundaries of your home and to value the presence of God. Whenever darkness tries to slip into my home, I take on the mode of spiritual warrior. I remember years ago, and I loved my dad, I really did, and I honored my dad, but my dad, growing up as a non-believer all of my life, he came to Christ after my mom passed away, came to visit us one time, and one of the things my dad did in my home growing up is whenever he disagreed with you or didn't like you, he gave you the silent treatment. Not just for like a day, but for weeks on end until you caved to his desires. And he came into my home one time with my kids where the presence of God is valued and he played that game in our home. And I sat my dad down in our master bedroom on the ottoman where I scold my children in private when they needed. And I told my dad, dad, I grew up with that and it was awful. And I said, now I protect this in my home. You can't bring that into my home. So here's the deal. You either walk out of this room and get that figured out or your son is gonna put you on an airplane like now. And my dad walked out of that room and figured it out. I was threatening to spank him. (laughs) Because while I honor and love my dad, this is now my responsibility to protect the presence of God in my home. And the same job I have in my home is the same job I have as the lead teaching pastor at Westside Family Church to make sure this is a place where the supremacy of Christ in God's presence is the most important. That when people walk in, they can feel the presence of God because he has been invited here. And whenever darkness tries to slip in, we overcome it and create the boundaries to make sure that God is here and he is healing us. Can I get an amen for that? On page 257, we have our key idea uh, for this entire message. It's a a concept I'd invite you to memorize, but right now, I'd like to ask you to say it out loud. Well, actually, before we go to the key idea, let me give you step two, okay? Step two, write this down. Surround yourself with other Christians committed to the same purpose. Now that leads us to our key idea on page 257. I want you to say it loud, out loud loud with me, ready? I fellowship with Christians to accomplish God's purposes in my life, in the lives of others, and in the world. This is exactly what we see practiced with the first Christians who gathered at the very first church in the city of Jerusalem. Their story is recorded in Acts chapter 2, which forms our key verse for this entire lesson. It's found on page 257, but I want you to see the fuller context on page 265, or you can just look in your program. Dr. Luke, the writer of this book, gives us a sneak peek into the living room of the first church that gathered in Jerusalem. Listen to this. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. I want you to underline the phrase, all the believers were together and had everything in common. The phrase had everything in common in the English is a collection of words. But when Dr. Luke wrote this, he only wrote a single word in the Greek. It is the word koinonia. There is just one word here. Biblical community is a collection of people who share a common purpose. 
It's important to note that this first church here in Jerusalem did not meet in buildings. As a matter of fact, the church won't have official buildings to meet in for another 300 plus years. At the time of the writing of this passage, there were 3,120 believers. If you recall, right before Acts chapter 2, 42, the 120 disciples in the upper room had just received the Holy Spirit, empowered to dispense the presence of God. They come out of the upper room into the city square, and Peter gives his first sermon and they go from, at the end of that sermon, from a small church of 120 to a mega church. I can't even imagine giving one sermon that goes from 120 to 3,120. I used to pastor a small church, but then one day I gave a sermon and it went to a mega church. But that's exactly what happened. Where do these people meet then? Well, the Bible tells us, we know from history, that they met in homes honeycombed throughout Jerusalem. And they've done excavations on Peter's home in Jerusalem and discovered that the average home would hold about 30 people. So if you do the math, 3,120 believers in Acts chapter 2 at the writing of this passage divided by 30 means that there were 100 little house churches honeycombed throughout Jerusalem. Here's a picture of Jerusalem. And if you can see the picture here, we're going to add more. And we're going to add more and more and more, all the way until we get to the bottom, and that is the picture of what was happening in Jerusalem. There was not a crevice or a corner where the presence of Christ was not being released for the healing of people. And because they were gathering in Jesus' name, they were releasing the presence of Christ all over Jerusalem. And you'll notice that this community was not did not exist just for the benefit of the members inside of the homes, but rather they also offered up this presence and care for those in the houses in between theirs. And they were releasing the presence of Christ. As a matter of fact, if you don't believe it, take a look at 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 15. Paul writes, For we are to God the pleasing aroma of Christ, among those who are being saved and those who are perishing. People who were hurting or far from God would get a whiff of the aroma of Christ from the community of believers and they were immediately drawn to it. As a matter of fact, this entire paragraph, take a look at it for yourself, the entire paragraph ends by saying, as a result of the way in which they lived, The Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. It didn't just stop at 3,120. The church in Jerusalem continued to grow. Uh, Historians tell us by the end of the first century, there were over 100,000 followers of Jesus in the city of Jerusalem. Encountering the aroma of Christ is irresistible. And we all long to be a part of such a community. As a matter of fact, when as a young teenager, um, whenever I started to go to church, I was the only one in the audience that didn't want the church service to end. It wasn't because the preacher was all that good. It's because, and I couldn't put my finger on it, there was something about being in that space that just spoke to my soul. Something that felt healing to me. And I knew the difference, and I didn't want to go back into my home While I had a reasonable home, a mom and dad who stayed together, Jesus wasn't invited into that home, and I just wanted to hang out in the church. The truth is, the Spirit of God within us was not meant to be a stagnant pond, but rather a river running through us. What happened to Adelie Gabora in her Boston neighborhood would have never happened in the first century church in Jerusalem, and it may it be our vision that would never happen in a neighborhood where a West Sider lives. Can I get an amen for that? And because we are committed to the practice of biblical community, we are committed to being a community of people who are plugged in to the will and to the word of God. We are committed when we gather in our home, when we gather with other believers to gather in his name around the purposes of Jesus. And when we do this, as Jesus promised, it releases the sweet healing aroma 
of God himself. And anybody who is in striking distance of our community is drawn into the irresistible community of God. Did you know that in our city of Kansas City, there are an estimated two, uh, 1,291 consensus block neighborhoods? So let me put a picture of our awesome city up. Within this city, there are 1,291 consensus block neighborhoods. Did you know that there are West Siders in 418 of these neighborhoods. You wanna see a picture of what that looks like? We took our database and we put it over Kansas City. Do you see where we're going, church? In 221 of these neighborhoods, we have two or more households. In 157 neighborhoods in Kansas City, we have three or more households. In 84 of these neighborhoods, we have five or more households. And I continue to go on until we get to the end. Actually, in two of these neighborhoods, we have more than 50 West Side households. Can you imagine if each home was committed to biblical community? A gathering in the name of Jesus releasing the presence of Christ in that home to be a safe and healing place for all the residents of that home and for anybody who would dare to darken the door. We should put a sign out on our doors. Those of us committed to releasing the presence of Christ in our home, enter with caution. Because if you have no interest in God, you're going to walk out with an interest in God because his presence is so irresistible. Can you imagine if that home then partnered with other Christian homes in that neighborhood? I tell you, church, this is what we've been dreaming about as we look at this map and wondered if a collection of West Side homes might not come together to partner to be the presence of Jesus in that neighborhood, plugged into the will and to the word of God, releasing the present aroma, presence of God, the sweet aroma of Christ, not only for the sake of their own benefit, but for the sake of the person far from God who doesn't believe anybody's coming. Wouldn't that be something? And we know that it goes beyond the neighborhood. For some of you, your sphere of influence is your work. For others, it is uh, where you play. And for others, it is your school. Wherever you go, two or more gathering together in his name will release the sweet aroma of Christ and everyone will experience healing. This is what a biblical community is all about. And we so desperately want this for you today. And so we have unlocked with the word of God this door and we invite you to open it. But we also want to remind you that behind every door, there is a story. That Adelie Gabori, she had a story. And that if you're a West Sider committed to God's principles, you come up to this door and you knock and you allow the Adelie Gaboris in your life to open up the door and you hear her story and then you allow the presence of God to heal and to minister and to comfort. Say it out loud with me together today, church. Ready? Come on, let's do it. I fellowship with Christians to accomplish God's purposes in my life, in the lives of others, and in the world. That's a concept. It's a truth. It's a practice. And now we dare you to walk through it. And if you walk through it, and God is at the very center of your life, just like with Israel, and just like with the church, as Moses said, you will be successful. Now, although we want this kind of community to be a healing influence in our city, the reality is we so desire for everyone who calls West Side their home, we desire for you to be connected. We do not want you to be an Adelie Gabori in our midst. We don't want you to be alone or disconnected connected. And so I strongly, strongly want to encourage you as step one, not only get connected with God, but make sure you connect yourself with a group of believers, either through a life group, which is step one, a service opportunity within this church, something to get you around other believers committed to being plugged in to the will and the word of God. That's how you experience all that God has for you. And everybody said... Amen. We're going to enter into a time of worship now. And as we're worshiping, there are going to be some people that are going to be baptized. 
an opportunity when they come out of the water, uh, identifying themselves with Jesus Christ for the body of believers. Even online, you can click that little heart button or the hand clap, you can do that. Uh, and let's celebrate with these people. Matter of fact, the first person to be baptized is a gal named Mary. She's, I believe, 78 years old. And she had a really, she's had a really, really rough life. Uh, she was in a home um, where there's a little bit of uh, legalism and they forced her to get baptized as a kid. And she told us, she says, this time I'm getting baptized my own decision. My own decision, right? And this is a, this is a big deal. Uh, she is suffering from um, uh, increased Alzheimer's, uh, but, she, but her mind is still there enough to know that she wants to go all in for Jesus. And every time when Mary comes out of the water, I want you to celebrate for her and for everyone else, not only here, but in our South Sanctuary, as well as our Speedway campus. Amen. All right, let's be standing as Mary's the first to be baptized.